So JJ, let's pick up on some of the players in the case. So we're working on the Dulce Marie Olivez case, five years old, missing out of Bridgeton since September, mid-September of 2019. This is a photo that the mom originally provided of Dulce in her kindergarten uniform. She was going to school at a Buck Shootum school. She'd only been there a week or so and had come home from school that day. When she came home from school, the mother said she took a little while to get dressed. They were gonna go out. It was a beautiful afternoon. She put on this uh, yellow shirt that had, I think, a hippopotamus on it and some flowered pants, sandals. This is a picture of her at that Sunoco gas station about an hour or so before she meant, went missing. How critical a piece of this information of the last visual video of the little girl is to this investigation? Well, it's important in that um, if the mother's not sure exactly what she was wearing, um, you know, here we have documented evidence of what she's wearing and that becomes yeah. important when they put the amber alert out uh, you know at least for the day or a few days uh, immediately following an abduction you know they want to be able to say that she was wearing a yellow shirt with a hippopotamus on it and, and yeah. checkered pants or flowered pants sure and if the mother you know can't remember she Dulce might have picked out her own clothes so the mother may not have really been paying attention to what she was wearing so this is important and that you know we know what she was wearing when she disappeared I want to walk you through Bridgeton City Park a little bit. So from that Sunoco station, which is kind of over here in Bridgeton, they would have likely driven into the park this way on Babe Ruth Drive. This is another through street. Bridgeton High School is right over here. This is the basketball court and the park. And this is where the mother parked right here in this little parking spot. It's next to um, a concession stand that's no longer in use. So this building was not operational at the time. They park here. Mom and younger sister stay in the car. They're scratching off lottery tickets. And Dulce and her younger brother, Manny, go running through these trees here, which there's, they're a little more dense at this point than they are now. This basketball court, there's a hill around it. There's a, there's a fence around it. It blocks the view of this playground. How challenging is this terrain after the fact for authorities, including the FBI, the card team who arrived the next day? Well, I don't know that necessarily you could say it's challenging, but obviously the problem is, you know, now you're losing a key eyewitness in the mother and that she can't see the playground um, where Dulce is headed to before she disappears. Um, and obviously there are no cameras in any of these buildings, um, even the operational buildings. So there's no, there's really nobody who's a potential witness to this unless there just happens to be somebody else in the park at the time. Yeah, you know, there were people a dog playing. Or playing basketball. Yeah, and they've interviewed all those people and they've interviewed some of those people multiple times. Are they important witnesses? Well, they are because obviously they were a lot closer to the last place we know Dulce was, which is that playground before she disappeared. Um, you know, if they're playing basketball, they may not be paying attention to two little kids going to a playground in a park. There's nothing unusual about that. So, sure. You know, it's 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 hard to know what the value of their information will be, but clearly if they had a view of the playground, one of them could have seen somebody who might have led Dulce off behind that uh, public works building, you know, with, with the younger brother talked we're, about. Yeah, we're told the younger brother dropped his ice cream somewhere in this vicinity and had seen a person in either that red van, red truck, Hispanic gentleman, light skin, medium build, acne on his face, somewhere behind these buildings. That's quite a distance from where she was parked at that point foot, and car, no surveillance cameras on here and no surveillance cameras put in since. Had they put in surveillance base. cameras since the then? Would that since help with anything? No, I mean not with this investigation. Obviously you need surveillance contemporaneous with her disappearance. The you know, now they wouldn't serve any purpose in this investigation. Okay. Um, I'm going to move over to the mom, and we talked about this a few minutes ago, but she was interviewed until after midnight, the same night that Dulce disappeared. She was at the park the next day. Talk to me about what you see in, in this picture here and the demeanor and how important her demeanor might have been to authorities that day. Well, immediately after the abduction, it's hard, I think, to put too much importance on a, a, the demeanor of a parent. Now, clearly, this... If there are no eyewitnesses to the abduction, the police are going to go on the assumption that it is an abduction, but they're always going to start um, closest to the victim. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think of uh, you know, the relationships to a victim as concentric circles, um, you know, the mother, uh, the father who is not, uh, you know, wasn't in the area, lives in Mexico, and he's kind of out of the picture, um, but you're always going to start closest and, and move out uh, because the simple fact is stranger child abductions are relatively rare. It's almost always a relative, uh, you know, or someone who has a relationship with the victim. So, 
that's where law enforcement's going to start. So, well, we're still on mom. Her right. So her phone? her demeanor immediately after the reported disappearance. It's important in the big picture. I, I don't think we can say just based on her demeanor at the time of that interview. Uh, you know, I don't think we can necessarily put too much importance on her demeanor right then, mm -hmm. but it is certainly something that behavioral analysts are going to look at um, her demeanor then, her, you know, her demeanor during the 911 call, her demeanor during these media interviews. Or a polygraph, um, per right. se. Uh, her, her demeanor during a polygraph or during the law enforcement interviews, which obviously we as the public don't have access to, but the Certainly. FBI's behavioral analysis unit does. Yeah, we don't uh, know the outcome of a polygraph. We do know that she had one or two cell phones and one was given back to her. So while we're on mom here, would they give her cell phone back if it contained critical evidence? No. I mean, if the, if the phone had something on it that was evidence of a potential crime, the police would keep it. Um, they For would, that very reason. Right, because now it's evidence of a potential crime. They don't know you know, the prosecutor may not know exactly how that evidence is going to be used ultimately at this point, but it's evidence. Sure. Um, so they're going on the assumption that a crime has been committed here, which, you know, a child abduction or a child disappearance I mean, is. So the prosecutor is looking at how are we going to prosecute this um, if it ever gets to that. I mean, the police obviously are looking for as much forensic evidence as they can collect mm -hmm. to use in the investigation. And the prosecutor is thinking about how are they going to prosecute the case. So. Yeah, if there's evidence on a phone, they're keeping that phone, Absolutely. even after they get the evidence off of it. Okay, this is uh, Chief Michael Garmari uh, of Bridgeton City Police. He arrived with his no officers that day, that. and right away they were on the ground thinking this is hide and seek. This is a child who wandered off Which into is the woods. 99 times out of 100, that's what it is. Okay, nothing was done. Nothing was done wrong at that point. I'm not trying to point blame, but he really only had what the mother gave him to go on. Correct. Correct. But she okay. And. and you know, she, the mother didn't see the abduction, per se. All she knows is what her three-year-old son said. Um, how reliable is a three-year-old? You know, a three-year-old is not going to be a witness in a criminal trial. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, the police are going, uh, you know, they, ha they have to be careful in how they approach this, but, you know, they're, they're going to say, okay, we have a missing child. Whether it's an abduction or a child wandered off, we have a missing child. Priority one, let's find, find the child. The child. No, no matter how the child disappeared, priority one is finding the child, and they're going to do whatever they can in the, in the minutes and hours after that to do that. Mm -hmm. How vital is an Amber Alert, obviously, um, because it goes out, uh, you know, across the country, but this was 30 hours right. beyond when she went missing. You know, that, that is a lot of time, and obviously an Amber Alert, if you have a usable description of a, of a suspect, of a vehicle, um, or know, license plate, which oh, we do not in this case. Right, um, but at least they had originally, you know, they were putting out information on a red, about a red van. You know, you want to get that information out to as many people in the public as possible, you know, through as wide a distribution as quickly as possible. Um, while that potential suspect, that potential vehicle, is closer to the crime scene, um, the more time that elapses, the further away they can get, and the harder it's going to be to get any usable information. For the police chief, we see his demeanor here a little bit and the prosecutor, Jennifer Webb McRae, give us an idea of what the conversation is prior to addressing the media and the press uh, together with the grandmother and, and pleading for that help. What's some of the talk behind the scenes? Well, obviously, I mean, if the prosecutor is gonna come and make a statement, uh, the prosecutor is not involved in the investigation from the beginning. That's the police department and the police chief. Sure. So obviously, he, the police department is going to brief her um, on as much as they know at that time. The prosecutor is, uh, you know, going to make a statement, but they have to be careful because they have to prosecute the case if someone is ever arrested, if there a crime was committed. So they have to think of the evidence of potentially, uh, you know, tainting a jury. Mm -hmm. So, you know, typically they're not going to put out a lot of information. They might, the police department even to this day could have very singular information um, that they don't want to make public. That's really not going to help catch a, a person who might have abducted her. Um, so, you know, those conversations are going to go on between the police department and the prosecutor. Here's everything we have. Here's what we should make public. Here's what we don't think we should make public and right. why. It could and feed people information and then they're coming forward to say what they right. learned on TV. Yes. Okay. I mean, because you, you know, if you're getting, if you're, if you're looking for tips from the public, you want those tips to be firsthand information, 
not secondhand information or people who are trying to get themselves on TV. Mm -hmm. The grandmother in the case, um, to our knowledge, she only speaks Spanish. Um, she's been very emotional every time we've seen her. We don't see the family dynamic here appearing anyway outwardly when we're, we're, we're there with them to be very loving. Does, does that weigh in? We know that, we know that grandmother um, actually had custody of Dulce, so she lived there. She didn't live with the mother. She lived with the grandmother. What is, um, how significant is that? Well, it could potentially be very significant. It's clearly something that the investigator is going to look at, something that the behavioral analysis unit is going to look at, um, you know, to try and build a picture of what was the family dynamic. Is there anybody in the family that might have motive? Um, or want her gone. Or want her gone. I mean, that's certainly a consideration in these types of instances. And, you know, we can look back at many, many cases where a, a parent or another close relative is responsible for the death of a child either on purpose or accidentally. Um, so there, there could be a lot of things, one, that we're not seeing publicly, uh, and two, that you know, the police are looking at, um, and certainly family dynamic, family relationships. Who did the victim live with? Who did mm -hmm. the victim spend most of their time with? And um, why, and right. why. Mm -hmm. um, you know, who are the biological parents who might be raising the child? These are all factors investigators are going to look at to try and build an accurate picture of why this child might have disappeared. Behind the scenes are they piecing this together similar to how we are with a puzzle and drawing lines and trying to make those connections as well be it uh, you know cell phone calls and who pinged what tower and all of those right, things I imagine. Yeah they're certainly going to try and put together a picture of everybody that has a relationship with Dulce as the victim Sure. Um, and all of the communications that could have gone on, all of the relationships, the family dynamics, that's all going to factor into this. Um, but again, there's also the, the possibility that this is a stranger abduction, someone completely unrelated to her, um, abducted her for whatever reason. So, you know, they're also going to be looking at that possibility and that's where things like the Amber Alert um, and the appeal for tips um, and continuing to look for any surveillance video that they might have missed. Five months is a long time. Most systems that are recording video are not keeping it that long. Sure. Um, so it's likely at this point that there is no usable surveillance video anywhere, even if they got a tip that the car was seen in a certain area. That chance is gone. Probably. This is the, um, who the family has told us is the, the father, um, who is now 25 years old and lives in Mexico. And how would investigators try to track him down? And if and once they do, what are, what are they asking? I mean, I understand that um, the person who, at least we believe, is the biological father um, was interviewed. So the Bridgeton police would work through the FBI with that. And the That's FBI. That's their role internationally, the FBI. Uh, well, the with. FBI has um, legal attache offices and embassies and consulates all over the world. There's a legal attache office in Mexico City that covers Mexico. Um, so FBI agents who are assigned to the Mexico City Legal Attaché Office would work with local authorities to locate and interview uh, the person who's been identified as her biological father. Asking they, things like? Well, uh, they would probably want to know. Uh, When's the last time you saw her? Right. Did you have any communications? Anything relevant to um, her living in the U.S. with her family? I mean, he's obviously not, he's not really part of their family. Um, but any information that he might have about family dynamics, about the relationship um, between the victim and her mother, her grandparents, all of that. Um, any records he might have communications, phone calls, texts, emails. They're looking and, at his phone too. Right. Yeah. They would look to see is there any, does he have any connection or any relevant information? Has anybody communicated or contacted him about her disappearance? Um, that would all be relevant. Um, so they would look at that. I mean, obviously, U.S. law enforcement authorities don't have subpoena authority in Mexico. They don't have the ability to compel him to be interviewed. but Or bring him back. Or bring him back unless he's charged with a crime, and then he could be arrested by the local authorities there and extradited. Um, but, no, they can't force him to come back. Mm -hmm. um, but the legal attaches offices work very closely with local law enforcement. I'm sure local law enforcement will help locate him, talk to him. Um, but he would be interviewed by FBI agents in Mexico and local police. JJ, a, a month after Dulce was taken, this was a sketch that Bridgeton police put out to us, and they didn't even go as far as to say this person was a person of interest. They said this is a man they want to talk to. What does that mean? 
it means that they don't really have sufficient information to say that they think he is the person responsible or even involved. Um, so it is somebody that they think has information that's relevant to this. They're not saying why they think that, um, and that may be information that they want to keep a little close to the vest because they don't want to tip their hand about how they've come to this description and this forensic sketch. Um, but it certainly does match the description that they initially put out in the Amber Alert of a, a young Hispanic male with a thin build. Um, now, they and then initially in the Amber Alert they said no facial hair in this. He appears to have a you know, mustache and a small goatee, but mm -hmm. you know, the forensic so the acne artist on the has skin. put some acne right. on his face. Um, you know, they could be going off both the information provided by Dulce's three-year-old brother and maybe people who are playing basketball in the park that might have seen somebody or anybody else who could have been in the park that might have seen somebody in the park. They might not be able to say, yes, we saw this person at the park near the playground or we saw this person in a red van. Mm -hmm. It may just be a common description that they got from several witnesses who were in the park at the time. Seeing everything that you see here, are you convinced that she was in the park? Well, I don't know that there's any way to know that at this point. I mean, we have her mother saying they went to the park um, and her three-year-old brother who is providing information that's consistent with them being in the park. Mm -hmm. But short, and again, we don't know if witnesses who might have been on the basketball courts might have said corroborated, that. corroborated that they were in the park. We don't know that because the police are not putting that information out publicly. Um, but I think we go with the assumption that she was in the park and that's where Dulce disappeared from, but it's not the only possibility. Right. So we look at it in those terms that yes, it is, it is one of many potential possibilities. And I think the police probably have a pretty good idea whether or not she was really in the park or not. Sure. Um, Last one or two questions just because I'm thinking of them now, but we, w what we didn't touch on was uh, the fact that they are relying so heavily on a Hispanic community to not be fearful that their immigration would be in jeopardy and to come forward and potentially is this a, could it take one person just like we talked about chewing gum or a cigarette but does one person potentially hold the key? in that community and what challenge is that, that it is a largely Hispanic community? Well, that's certainly a challenge. Um, there could be somebody out there who has a piece of information that could be very, very important, and they are afraid to come forward because of their immigration status and their fear of deportation. That is a challenge for law enforcement all over this country in communities of immigrants who are here both legally and illegally. Sure. Um, and. It has sparked a lot of debate about the role of law enforcement and immigration and enforcing immigration laws. Um, in a lot of instances, police departments have come out publicly and said, you know, we are not here to enforce immigration laws. We are here to investigate and enforce local laws that we're responsible for. But those communities don't always believe that. You have some communities that are naturally suspicious of any law enforcement, mm -hmm. whether it's local, state, or federal. Um, and it poses real challenges in a case like this where there appears to be so little available forensic evidence, surveillance video, uh, you know, there, there's not much that's been put out publicly that says they have a lot to go on right now. So what they need is tips from the public and that public is largely at this point in an immigrant community that's probably afraid to come forward. Right, and it doesn't take hundreds of tips, it could take one. It could take one. It, it's, they're going to get hundreds and thousands of tips. The vast majority of those are going to be false or just inaccurate. Um, but there is information out there. Somebody has information about this, whether it's a relative of Dulce's or a complete stranger. Right. Somebody saw something and has some information about where she is. Right, a child just doesn't vanish off the face of the earth. When does a case, JJ, become a cold case? There's no hard and fast rule. Um, certainly in a child abduction, the case is never going to be closed um, if it appears that, and there's, again, there may not be any forensic information at this point to say that a murder has been committed. I mean, there's no way to know. I mean, obviously you hold out hope that she was abducted and that she's alive and well somewhere. Um, the more time that goes on, the less likely that starts to appear. But you're always going to hold out hope. 
Um, but, you know, certainly at some point the trail is of information and evidence is going to grow cold. The longer you get time-wise from the crime, obviously people's memories fade. Forensic evidence disappears. Um, that's what's going to make a case cold. Um, you know, there's probably no usable surveillance video unless somebody calls in a tip that they saw someone that matches the description, they can pull surveillance video now that, that might show an image could potentially be her. Um, you know, it, it's going to grow colder by the day at this point. And that's, you know, unfortunate. And that's why it's important to, at this point, to keep information out there about her so that maybe that tip does come in.